welcome. Thanks for coming out. Um, as always, questions are welcome. So, uh, you know, just shout them out, raise your hands, whatever. Um, I will. I will not be show. I do have show and tell initially of some of the plants for the members only pre-order plant sale. I do not have all 87 of them to show you. Thank goodness. Many of them aren't on hand right now. But I do have some highlights. Um, oh lordy. Eupatorium rugosum, the, the white um, snake root, um, is a native woodland wildflower. Um, this is a selection called chocolate. By this time of the year, the purple foliage that um, you know it had earlier in the year is largely turned to green. But the late summer, early fall flowers are really welcome, especially in the shade garden. It's also been fun um, down in the nursery where I don't know several dozen of these sit. When I go down to water them, there's millions well not millions but many butterflies and other pollinators are visiting the flowers um, Amsonia hubrichtii um, is one of the blue stars um, another native herbaceous perennial um, the wild type generally has pretty good fall color this is a new selection I've never even heard of it before this year called butterscotch it has phenomenal, uh, you know, amber-colored foliage in the fall. So you have this blue flowers in the spring, and um, you know, attractive enough green foliage through the summer. Then really good fall color, which is something we don't usually think of when it comes to herbaceous perennials. Um, sun or part sun. Um, these tops are fairly small, but this time of year, when you buy a perennial, it's going to come back very much bigger because it, it's been packing away a lot of food in that root system. And so next year, I'd, I'd expect it to be, you know, that tall and about that wide. Um, I always hate to say deer don't eat this or that because someone is going to say they eat it in my garden. That would be terrible. Well, <laughs> our expert is here today. They don't yeah. eat My deer don't eat it. Yeah, and in a, in a you know, before I, um, started in this job at the Arboretum. I've worked for a bunch of different people and most of them had huge flocks of deer and this was never touched in their garden. Um, I guess I'll get the herbaceous perennials out of the way. This is um, Stachys. It's a cultivar called Humalo. Um, if you know the name Piet Udolf, the uh, Danish is it? Or Dutch, Dutch garden designer. There was that movie about him uh, last year or the year before. He was also the principal designer of the uh, plantings on the High Line in, in Manhattan. Well, Humalo is the name of his garden. And um, this, I've not seen a specific epithet applied to this. It's a lot like Stachys spicata. Um, uh, but Humalo is a selection with dark pink flowers is really a beauty, but I love the foliage too, and it's fairly evergreen, so you have this handsome foliage. And it is a member of the mint family. Um, you know, the mint family composes many things like salvia and uh, lavender, and you know, um, I think when you say, tell somebody it's in the mint family, they think it's gonna spread like a mint. This is a clump form, it doesn't really spread at all. In bloom, it's about 18 inches tall. Um, mid-spring bloomer and being in the mint family deer generally need it alone summer shade um it certainly will grow very well in full sun also does well in part sun or light shade what about wet or dry soil? um i would avoid soggy but other than that okay. i would full, avoid extremes okay um it's it's an easy plant it's not finicky, but uh, you know, won't tolerate soggy soil. Uh, we have two uh, different clematis in the uh, pre-order plant sale. This is one of the new uh, ones that are bred with very short inner nodes, so it's, it's less a vine and more sort of a low trailing plant, a little ground cover plant. I think an ideal place to plant it would be a, on top of a wall where it could ca cascade um, over the wall. This is one called Bijou or bijou. Um, 
think I brought the yeah I brought the other one up. Many of you have probably been gardening for a long time. Do you remember when the only way you got clematis was in this little cardboard tube? And the plant was like one tiny little frail, frail stem. And if it made it through the first year, it would be good after that. But it was sort of touch and go. But so, you know, this is the other one we have. Uh, Killian Donahue, I think is its name. I didn't realize I grabbed one without a label. But I, I just thought... This is a nice husky plant that's going to be uh, quite a show next year. Um, we have um, quite a few things that we raised here. Um, two plants from seed that Mark collected in China. This is the calicarpa. And these are all described when you go on the MOPS uh, website. There's descriptions. This was described as having um, something like glossy uh, pale purple fruit or something. I don't, Mark hasn't yet identified what species, but it's hard to go wrong with the calicarpa. And this is uh, Lindera. Our native spice bush is Lindera benzoan, but this is a Chinese species, probably Lindera strychnifolia. And it's evergreen. Um, most of the Linderas I know are deciduous. Um, pretty little leaf. You notice it's sort of chalky white on the underside of the leaf. Um, pretty veination in the leaf. The, the Linderas, um, you know, have small yellow flowers. Not the showiest thing in bloom, but this, this is one that I enjoy looking at the foliage year round. Um, let's see. We have a number of shrubs that were. Um, bred by um, uh, Tom Rainey, a uh, plant breeder here at NC State. This is an azalea. Um, so, most, so many of these things are brand new cultivar, uh, cultivars, so they have these horrible cultivar names. This cultivar name is NCRX3. I don't know how you pronounce that other than spelling it out. Um, it's being marketed as, its trademark name is Perfecto Mundo Double Pink. Um, it is a repeat blooming azalea, but Tom Rainey also put a huge amount of ep emphasis on disease resistance. It's a pretty double pink flower. I, I enjoy looking at the foliage. It's a nice dark glossy green. Itea virginica, our native uh, sweet spire. Um, this is a new selection. The trademark name is Love Child. Um, Love Child? Love Child, yes. Uh, I don't <laughs> want to know the story behind it. Um, the cult of our name is Baltasun. You know, again, um, probably from Bailey Nursery. Um, Itea virginica is a spreading shrub, so it's not a plant due it's a plant you want to give some thought to as to placement, but if you need to cover, you know, a bigger area, it will spread. It will extremely happy in wet sites. So if you have a wet site where, um, you know, a lot of other things won't grow. And in, again, in client's gardens, I've never known deer to eat it. Um, it has spikes of white fragrant flowers in the spring, and the foliage um, colors up a nice scarlet in the fall. What's different about that one? Um, it's a little bit more compact than um, straight, than like Garnet or... Um, little Henry? It's, it's sort of a, bit, a little bit bigger than Little Henry. Little Henry's real small. Um, this is supposed to be three to four feet tall. Um, most people know Vitex. The typical color of Vitex is blue-violet. This is a pink one. It's also a little bit more compact than the great big um, standard blue ones. And um, a plant I've not known deer to eat. The foliage is very fragrant. Um, and you know, it's one that blooms for many months in the summer and highly favored by bumblebees. Um, a beautiful little Nandina, one called Flirt. Um, the foliage is sort of blue and then the new foliage is um, is purplish and actually flirt is its trademark name of the um, 
cult of her name is actually Murasaki, which is Japanese for purple. And it's a compact growing, uh, it's a sport of harbor dwarf, which only gets about like this tall. So you think it'll be the same size then? As harbor dwarf? Yes. Um, a compact white flowered crepe myrtle that's been blooming all summer. Um, it has the cultivar name of G2X13377. It's being marketed as infinity white. I think it's one that, you know, gets about four feet tall. Oh, I brought up two of those bugs. Okay. If I wasn't in between gardens right now, um, home gardens that is, um, I'd be buying this one for my own garden. It's a selection of a Japanese species of Leucothui, Leucothui kiskii, um, a compact selection with, with a bronzy new foliage. I th just think it's such a beautiful thing. And Leucothui has this graceful arching habit to the stems. Um, small pendant white flowers, a lot like Japanese Andromeda in the spring, but a beautiful little evergreen shrub for um, year round. I think this one gets about two feet tall. Let's see. You would think that information would be easy to find on the label. I'm not finding it right away, but I, if you go on the mops list, we'd have all that information. And um, in a friend's garden out in Chatham County, where he has, you know, huge herds of deer, um, they never bother his Lakotui piece out in the woods. Um, how, much sun, how much sun do you think that one? I wouldn't put it in hot sun. It's really more of a woodland plant. Okay. And does it need to be moist then? Um, it's probably one of those, it's Lukothui's in the same family as azaleas and rhododendrons, so uh, I would think um, moist but well-drained soil, a lot of organic matter in the soil, probably really likes a nice thick mulch layer. Um, a compact growing fig, Little Miss Figgy, I think it's also handsome foliage plant too, with those deeply fingered leaves. And well, well, with figs, more sun the better. Um, you know, our sun is so strong, it does, certainly doesn't need to have sun all day. But I'd say you'd want a minimum six hours of sun if you're growing it for fruit production. You just want to look at the pretty leaves, which is not unreasonable, then you could grow it in less sun. Um, on the website you'll see pictures of this Japanese Androma, Andromeda Pieris, um, Japonica interstella. It's a very, very red flower. Um, not fire engine red, sort of purpley red, but um, you know, much darker than any that I've seen. And the Japanese Andromedas are handsome evergreen shrubs. Well, that's just a taste of what's on this um, list, so I Hope you'll find lots of choice things that you uh, can't live without on the list. All right. Um, today's topic is um, the year begins anew. Um, gardeners often talk about the growing season. Well, um, in a colder climate, you have the growing season, and then you have the other half of the year where nothing grows, everything freezes solid, and, and it's certainly not a growing season. But in warmer parts of the world, like Raleigh, North Carolina, um, there isn't a time of the year when th something's not growing. And this is the time of year when a lot of the things that have been dormant through the summer come back into growth. It's also a time to my mind when sort of the bulb season starts. Some things have already bloomed out. Um, a lot of the lycoris have already bloomed and finished blooming. We'll see a few today. Um, the rhododendrons we'll take a look at in a moment. Um, 
they're probably past their peak, but um, there'll be more bloom in a little little while. And some things are being held back by um, our extreme drought. Um, October is also when the, the true fall blooming crocus, not the culture, can start. But I think we can forgive them if, if we don't find any on the first day of October. But certainly mm -hmm. at, some, at some point in October, um, most of the earliest of the fall blooming crocus will start blooming. Crocus um, speciosus and uh, pulchellus and gulimii and quite a few others. I forget how many species of crocus there are. I think something approaching a um, hundred or so. And the curious thing about um, the genus Crocus is that the most common one, Crocus vernus, the big Dutch hybrids, um, are about the last of the crocus to bloom. Um, you know, you can have crocus in bloom from October into March, um, with, and not even, you don't even have to grow a, all that large a number of species because there's some that have you know, start in October and others November, December, January, February into March. Um, well, we'll start our ramble. Um, please ask questions as we go along. Cyclamen are, uh, there is one species of cyclamen that blooms through the, um, through the summer, if you can uh, make it happy. It's cyclamen uh, perparacens. Um, it's a species native to the Alps of um, Europe um, and so it's probably largely dormant in cold winters and then it grows through the mild moist summers there but most of the the other species of cyclamen and there's something around maybe 20 species of cyclamen um, are Mediterranean plants and so they're dormant through the dry summer but then they come into growth in the fall and the winter time and this is um, this little cyclamen here is cyclamen heterofolium. Heterofolium means foliage like hetera, and hetera is English ivy. And um, cyclamen heterofolium is the easiest of the hardy cyclamen to grow. Um, and it'll start blooming as, as early as uh, July, and it sort of spit and sputter for months, and then it'll have a real heavy display of bloom, oh, October, November. And j the foliage is just starting to come up. And these are some real pretty silver leaf forms of it. We'll probably see others in the garden. And then the, these blank spaces here will be carpeted. Here's a bunch of foliage here. The foli the, these blank spaces here will be carpeted with the foliage of cyclamen all winter long. So even though the flowers are, you know, really, really pretty, the foliage is, is maybe just, maybe an even more valuable for garden display than the floral display. We're seeing a lot of real pale ones, some white ones here. The typical color of cyclamen per, uh, heterofolium is, is pink, like this flower here. There are many, many uh, seed strains of cyclamen heterofolium with various degrees of silvering. The one thing you don't usually see is a cy cyclamen heterofolium folium with a solid green leaf because even the wild types have silver veining through the leaf. And there's some selections with different shaped leaves like long, narrow leaves. So, um, uh, you know, they've been in gardens long enough that gardeners have selected all sorts of forms of it. And I'm going to get just a little bit off topic. This fern is another plant that's in the uh, members only pre-order plant cell and it was so pretty, so pretty, I'm not very pretty. I was so happy that I was able to find this plant to offer to our, our members because though this thing has been slow to bulk up, it, it never has a bad day. And I don't know what you think about that, but I think that's a drop dead gorgeous fern. And um, it just gets better every year. And it's, um, there's its name, Arachnoides standishii. Arachnoides, oides, the oides ending would mean resembling. So I guess it's referring to another, resembles some other fern and standishii. 
um, Mr. Standish got, uh, had something to do with this fern or someone named it in, in his honor. Um, what about resembling a spider? Well, I don't know how well, that would, would be, but... Yeah, it could be, you know, because they're arach arachna is spider, but maybe. Maybe some aspect of the plant we're not observing looks like spiders, like maybe the sorry on the underside of the leaves, but I'm not seeing. It has the common name of upside down fern, which I don't understand. Can somebody explain that to me? <laughs> some fern expert? Down. What? <laughs> what did you say? I'm just joking. <laughs> okay. It's obviously it, upside down. Is it because the stem, the stems on this side rather than the underside? If you look at those, it's different. Yeah. The stem looks more, I don't know what to call it, but it looks more. Yeah. Yeah. Doug, the same person that named it, uh, because it looked like a spider, named it Upside Down Fern. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Real helpful person. <laughs> um, not really on, it, on within today's topic, but I'm going to point out a plant that I'm really excited about. Maybe I've done this 32 times this year. But this little uh, Syningia, Syningia eumorpha. Yeah. Syningia mm. is the same genus as uh, Floris cloxinia. Um, and what I'm excited about, it came through last winter. Um, the African violet family to which it belongs is largely a tropical family. So it's, it's and there's other Syningias that have been winter hardy for a long time. But, you know, this one is more like the Floris Gloxinia than, than like the Syningia Salovii hybrids that we'll see later on. Um, and it blooms all summer long. This year something's decided to eat the foliage to a small extent, but um, um, it's, still, it's still more than earning its keep. Now, I'm hoping that we can eventually get some seed off of these little capsules. Syningia, oh, that seems pretty good. Syningia seed is, is, is tiny little seeds, sort of like foxglove seeds or begonia seeds. But Mark, uh, Mark Wethington, the Arboretum Director, uh, gets seeds from a lot of other public gardens seed list. And he's, he got seed of this so often um, he said to us one time, if I order that again, you don't need to bother sowing it. But that was, that was before we um, planted some out and discovered that it's actually winter hardy. Um, so um, if I had the seed again, I'd certainly sow it and distribute a large number of them. I think we patted in the giveaway last summer, last October. I don't know. Okay. Um, Good. We'll head out to the brick circle in the parking lot there. I'll, I'll try not to keep us out in the sun too terribly long. The little um, Rhodophiala bifida is a little am amaryllis relative. You see it looks a lot like an amaryllis. I think I can pick this one flower. It's probably not going to make it through this hot afternoon. It looks like a little amaryllis. Um, and indeed, one of its names in the past was Amaryllis advena. Um, see, it had a big flush of bloom, but if you look down here, there's a bunch of flower stalks A lot of bulbs just have one bloom period, you know, the, like a tulip, you think it puts up the flower stalk and that's going to be the one and only flower it has. It doesn't have, you know, a week later put up more. But this little rhodophiola, if you look at the base amongst the leaves, there's a whole bunch of new spikes coming up. Hmm. And I suspect a good watering would uh, prompt it to um, put up more. It's, you know, easy as can be, just once uh, average soil in a sunny location. Um, has a bunch of common names, mostly um, several of them referring to the time of year it blooms, like hurricane lily, schoolhouse lily. It's also known as the oxblood lily because of the color. Um, 
for the longest time it was something you couldn't buy, it was just to pass along, but you had to know somebody who had it in their garden and get it from them, but now it's sort of, it's entered the mainstream, you can buy it, you know, for mail order bulb nurseries. The, like so many garden plants, the common form is sterile, but there are some fertile types which will produce seed. Any questions on that before we move on, or people want to bask out in the sun here? Mm -hmm. No. Okay. What, so, what? You, how long do you think the bloom period is on this? Because that was bloom. That's been blooming a while, right? It was in full bloom several weeks ago, and you know. I don't know if you see all the little red right. flower buds come up. So it's going to have another big uh, flush of bloom, so several weeks. So that's pretty long for yeah. Flower. Yeah. I'm going to stop here just long enough to say there's quite a few fall and winter blooming bulbs in this area. Um, so, some um, really choice um, crocus and um, other small bulbs that were made possible by a, a donation from a member. Um, there's a mail order bulb nursery called Odyssey Bulbs that sells a lot of things that you're not going to find in the in the big bulb retailers. So if you're looking for something, you know, the genus Crocus is big, but if you go to the main bulb dealers, you're only going to find, not counting all the cultivars, you're only going to find, you know, 10, 12 different species. If you go to Odyssey Bulbs, you'll find mostly things that you can't get elsewhere and a, a lot of those are fall blooming but if we get a rain sometime um, we'll see some bloom this fall this is the most com well yeah it's the most common of the spider lilies in the south this is uh, the spider lilies well there's several different plants named spider lilies these spider lilies are Lycoris. This is Lycoris radiata. It's been in gardens in the south for probably 150 years or more. Um, the Lycoris and the Rhodophiala are in the Amaryllis family, and generally members of that family, which include daffodils, are not eaten by deer. Um, just think, if we didn't have the deer issue, I wouldn't have half as much to say today. Um, <laughs> or any day but um you know i i don't know i just think that's a spectacularly beautiful flower the long spidery stamens are, are really special great cut flower um lycoris radiata is there seems to be a lot of different strains of it because there's some that, that in the garden that finished blooming weeks ago and ones like this that are you know still putting up flower spikes um, no, not in bloom terribly long, but the way time flies by, it's just a matter of minutes between w one fall and another, so mm -hmm. I certainly wouldn't be without it. Um, the Lycoris is not a big genus, and so many of the ones found in the wild are thought to be interspecific hybrids. Um, but uh, they fall into two different growth habits. Ones like Lycoris like radiata, they will put up foliage this time of year and the foliage will be green all winter. It looks a lot like liriope foliage. And so in zone seven, we can grow ne nearly all the Lycoris, but in colder climates, you can only grow um, the ones that don't put up foliage until the spring. Because in a colder climate than zone seven, the ones that have foliage through the winter month sustain too much damage to the foliage and so they don't make a lot of food and pack it away in the bulb so over a number of years they usually dwindle away through uh, starvation but easy easy bulb and um, nowadays there's so many new um, uh, cultivars and hybrids available plantalites nursery certainly is the best source for a wide range of um, lycoris and the giveaway and the giveaway yeah, we have, um, last year, one of our members um, was thinning out his garden and gave us hundreds and hundreds of bulbs of this Lycoris radiata, and um, we sold hundreds of pots of Lycoris radiata, but we had one flat of, I think, 18 pots left in the nursery, which were sort of, it was time to just be done with them, so they're in the get giveaway. 
Um, we really only came up here as a shortcut to the geophyte border or the bulb border. Um, but I do want to say we've been doing a whole lot of planting up here. Though at the Arboretum, often what we're planting are tiny little plants, so it doesn't have instant impact. Um, you know, for instance, this uh, agave is, well, it's one of those Spanish names I'm not sure I'm going to pronounce. It's H-U-A, Huasteca Giant. And now that foliage is going to get about like five feet tall. Mm. So, you know, think of this huge architectural plant with another one repeated over here. Wow. And uh, what I wanted was something that stood out when you're dead. You see those two people over there? When they, If they were looking here, they'd have something big and bold to draw their attention. The other thing is um, I've um, almost, I've been in this job almost two years. If you remember last summer, not everybody, but the Arboretum in good parts of this area, it rained more days than not. So it was really easy to plant because I didn't have to, um, you know, water every other day. We, we're continuing to plant, but it means we're slaves to the uh, hose right now. Um, but this summer, probably being a more normal summer, a drier summer, I've realized the only reasonable plants to plant up here in these beds that are primarily gravel are things that are extremely drought tolerant. Um, so things like agaves and cactus. We, uh, a member gave us a donation of a lot of hardy cactus that he raised from seeds. So it's so nice to be able to plant multiples of something instead of just one. Um, so, you know, we've done a lot of planting up here. Um, they're mostly small things at this time, but look for them to develop over the next couple years. Right, we'll pass through to the uh, bulb border. You can stop me if there's anything that catches your attention. We saw the rotofiala, the hurricane lily or schoolhouse lily, down in the parking lot. Here's uh, one. The flowers are limp. I'm sure it's extremely dry, but you get a better sense of the display. It's pretty little pure red flower. Um, there's other things, you know, there are some things that aren't really starting into growth, but this is the time of year when dahlias are often at their best, but um, it's so dry. We do water when we can, but it's hard to water things enough when it's this hot and dry. This um, oxalis or oxalis bowii is dormant all summer, but then it comes up now and blooms in the fall. I think that maybe in a area with the milder climate, it might bloom well into the winter months, but here um, it comes up in the fall and blooms nicely, but then when we have a hard frost, it sort of ends its floral display. The foliage is a little bit distorted this year. I don't know why. It's a, you know, a trifoliate leaf. But you, you think of the flower, a typical flower of an oxalis, but a pretty good sized flower, about a, you know, maybe almost half an inch across. You know, there are quite a few different oxalis in this border. This is the um, Iron Cross one, but it, it comes up in the spring and is present all through the summer. Yeah, it has a flower. Nothing, nothing's at its best today. Typical five-petaled oxalis flower. I'll go off topic a little bit more. Yeah. Again. Um, Brent and Becky's bulbs, which is a really nice mail-order bulb nursery in uh, Gloucester, Virginia, donated a bunch of plants this summer. And this is a allocasia we've not grown before. And, and wasn't even planted until July, but I think it's a very handsome thing. Um, Alocasia um, Regal Shields. Not sure it's going to be winter hardy, but um, something like this is just thinking it's finally warm enough on a day like today. <laughs>
the, you know, a lot of the things that are really good through the worst of summer are the things that um, are come from warmer parts of the world. Well, will this plant survive? It looks like it's dying. Uh, this plant? Yeah. Um, it's a peony. It's the wild parent of the common garden peony, um, peony um, cefruticosa. No, like the flora. Thanks. Um, you know, it's it's October. It's been a long, long growing season. I'm not at all concerned about the browning on the foliage. It's it's shutting down for winter. Um, you know, the the um, herbaceous peonies. Um, many of them do really well for us in this area, but they're also from much colder parts of the world where the growing season is much shorter, so it's probably been in growth longer than it would in its native China, up in the mountains or somewhere. Um, but, you know, being herbaceous, the moment this got too sh shabby, we could just cut it to the ground. You don't have to wait till frost. Does that answer your question? Yes, yeah. Um, you know, like, like, I think a good, if you're going shopping for hostas, I think a good time to uh, go looking at hostas is this time of year and see which ones still look good because many, many of them don't hold up through the hot, um, you know, especially dry summer. Um, you know, go, go to a garden that features a lot of hostas and see which ones still, still look great. One we didn't point out out front on the entrance berms is an old one, um, Halcyon, is that right? An old blue one. That looks great up until frost. It just foliage is tough and it looks um, nice and clean all summer long. But um, if you've been noticing how shabby this roof is, is getting, just this morning we picked up 116 foot one by eight boards to replace all of these. And um, probably all of the work will be done by our construction volunteers. And um, Jim started painting some of the boards. But um, there's one section they're gonna do before moonlight. I think it's probably this section and the rest will wait until after moonlight. Yeah, we saw Cyclamen heterofolium out front. There are other fall blooming species, and this is a little one. It's just starting. Um, this is Cyclamen silicium, um, more delicate flower and a smaller leaf. And heterofolium, the tubers on heterofolium can get about this big. And its growth habit, the, the petioles, the leaf stalks, are very wide spreading. So the, this crown of the plant might be here, but the leaf might be coming up over here because the leaf stalk is so long and sprawling. But most of the others um, are much smaller tuber. You can see the tuber on this. It's about an inch and a half in diameter. And it'll just make a little circle of leaves, sort of like an African violet. And um, now over here, we have a slightly confusing situation because we have this foliage of a uh, a sarum of you know the woodland plants that are called gingers but you see this one leaf here this is um cyclamen coom which is just starting into growth now it won't bloom until about december but the foliage comes up ahead of the uh, flowers whereas heterofolium is doing the opposite thing um, but cyclamen Coom is one of my favorites because I hate Christmas, I hate December, I hate those short, shortest days of the year, but Cyclamen Coom will be out in the garden in December blooming, looking impossibly cheerful. Of course, maybe come December we'll still be having 90 degree days. <laughs> and we're talking about signs of the new year, and I always think a really true sign that summer is ending and um, fall is coming are these gorgeous uh, riding spiders. Now, has anyone ever heard the myth that you don't show your teeth to the riding spider because they'll fall out? <laughs> That's one of the crazy things a former co-worker elsewhere told me. <laughs> yes, yes. See the, the, I forget what, somebody tell me what the little zigzag in the center is called. There's zipper? 
a zipper. A zipper, I love it. <laughs> now, there, there's something that... But um, they're such beautiful creatures. They're pretty scary looking too, you know. I wouldn't <laughs> want to turn around and see one sitting on my shoulder or something. Okay. Somebody in this group asked for a source for cyclamen. And if you don't make it up to Pine Knot Nursery this Friday or Saturday, the same grower should be at our spring plant sale in as it was this past spring. And this is yet another species of cyclamen. This is cyclamen gracum, meaning indicating it's from Greece. And other uh, you know similar areas. Um, it's a lot like heterofolium, but the foliage isn't really widespreading like um, heterofolium. The leaves are again veined with silver. Um, it's one that really wants a spot that's dry in the summer. Um, Cyclamen heterofolium is a bit tolerant of summer irrigation, but most of these cyclamen really want a spot that's not kept wet through the summer months because that's, you know, in, they're Mediterranean plants and so they're, they expect to be uh, dry through the summer months. On the other edge of the bed is more um, cyclamen heterofolium. Um, you know, blooming largely without any foliage now, but again, the foliage be real pretty. What shall we look at at this point? And how are we doing for time? It's too late, so we minutes. have a bit more. Yeah. Right. Where shall we go from here? I don't know. Um, I don't know. Someone suggested going to the monocot garden. We could do that, or you want to stay in the shade? Oh, let me point out this beauty. Um, Miletia, Miletia pulchra. Pulchra meaning uh, pretty. Um, you might know th the plant that is called evergreen um, wisteria, which is a different species of miletia. But this miletia is not a vine. This is, you know, a self-supporting shrub. It spreads slowly underground. This is many, many years old, and it's gotten, what, about six, eight foot wide. Um, foliage is beautiful all summer. It starts blooming in late summer and bloom up until frost. I just enjoy looking at the growth habit and the foliage and then the flowers are a nice uh, bonus. Um, this is a spot where it gets quite a bit of sun in the morning but then it's shade in the afternoon. I'm sure it'd thrive out in full sun. Um, I wouldn't plant it in a dark shady spot but really worthwhile. It is deciduous, so it doesn't have much presence in the summer garden, but I think, you know, anything that looks fresh this time of year, and this is not part of the arboretum that's irrigated. The only part of the arboretum that's irrigated on a regular basis, meaning that a clock is turning it on, is what you just experienced in the lath house. The lath house is sort of our nursery for, um, you know, getting special little things started, and once they get established in there, we move them out in the real world to see how they deal with the growing conditions that are typical of most gardens and landscapes. Why would we be wasting water on this scurfy turf out here? Because this is where the plant giveaway happens, and we have to put about 400 little stakes in the ground, and so we're watering it only to soften up the soil. Um, Look what they do for you all. Yeah, well, have any of you not been to the giveaway? You've not been to the giveaway? Well, you um, fix that this year, right? <laughs> you, 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 you can watch it on YouTube, right? Yep. Okay. JC started the giveaway many decades ago, yep. and that was a scary event. Viv, do you probably remember it? Would it you say it was a scary event? With the whistle once, and everybody grabbed with you. It was a shark feeding frenzy. Yeah. Oh, I don't. But I stayed away for it for years because, you know, I don't need plants that bad that I'm going to elbow grandma out of my way. 
But people would grab whatever they can, and then I think some of them would say, well, I don't really want all that I grab, but could I trade it for what you have, and that kind of stuff. It's a choreographed ba ballet now. And the reason why we put 400 stakes in it, a big rectangle is defined on the field. It's divided into qu quadrants. And so every plant that we have eight or more of is in equal numbers each one of those quadrants. And if it's Galtonia candigans and it's at stake 22, it's at stake 22 in each of those. So that's why we have 100 stakes, one through 100, or it might be actually more this year in each quadrant. And that's why we're softening up the soil. And then um, the actual process, and maybe Chris, you should describe it, but I'm the beautiful face in front of the camera. Um, <laughs> people, yeah, and you know, if you want to come, do not be here after nine because everything disappears. Chris said 15 minutes. I think it's more like 10 minutes. Um, do not come here after nine. There's no point in coming after nine. But there's no reason why you need to get here at 7.30 because everybody has an equal chance to line out line up outside the field and nobody's going in that field to grab plants until nine o'clock so if you get here at 7 30 you have no greater chance of grabbing what you want than the person who arrived at a minute before nine but chris blows a horn or something like that and everyone goes in and this is detail i'm not sure of do they grab one plant three. Three. three all right horn blows three horn blows three horn blows three horn blows whatever's left so only each one of Yep. Yeah, only one of anything and only three plants each time. And each time everybody gets back off the field. <laughs> and and most people are, follow the rules really well. <laughs> Chris is pretty scary. Um, and then it's only when there's very few plants on the field that it's like one, two, three, madhouse. But it's there's almost nothing left on the field at that point. And it's incredibly civilized. Marilyn, where, where did you go? You said it, you're still scared of it. Um, maybe. I, I go. I yeah. It's, it's well, and, and <laughs> if you're a hysteri hysterian, historian <laughs> of garden carts, it's the place to be. You will see a hundred different variations of garden carts and other means of <laughs> conveying plants. It's, I, I just don't know where some of these things get dug up from. Sleds, baby buggies. Yeah. I, I equate the video to the old, the old territory. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You might notice a lot of cannas in locations where you didn't see them in the years prior to this one. And they just all came up from seed. There were a bunch, I guess, up on the roof. And I don't know whether we had visitors that collected seed and cast them here or there or. In, you know, the other thing is loaded up on one of our debris, debris uh, trailers, you know, dragging them out. They might have gotten spread, but these are all seedlings that came up this summer. Um, an old fashioned common name for cannas is um, Indian shot, India shot, because the hard, hard seeds were used as an alternative to buckshot in a, in a rifle. But these represent the wild type of certain species of cannas, I, I think, I don't know that we could assign a species to any one of them. I think they're hybrids between species, but these small flowers are typical of a lot of the canna species and hummingbirds love these small flowers. I like this one enough that I think I'm gonna take a piece home with me at some point. The bugs haven't gotten into them. Foliage looks um, pretty good. Good point. Yeah, the uh, the point was that the bugs haven't, the canna leaf rollers haven't damaged the foliage much. And um, yeah, the, they, the canna leaf rollers affect different cannas to different degrees. And these leaves are sort of not real. Well, here we have some action here. Are not really tightly rolled up. But um, the canna leaf roller, it's sort of a misnomer because they do not roll up the leaf. There are caterpillars that will take a flat leaf, fold them over, and stitch it, and then the um, 
caterpillar then is in the protected environment of a folded up leaf. Um, the, canna, the butterfly or moth of the canna leaf roller lays the eggs in a leaf that hasn't yet unrolled. And I don't know whether it's parent or um, the caterpillar. You can see some little strands of silk here that they use to keep the leaf from unrolling. Mm -hmm. And you know, I remember many decades ago, you could grow cannas and you didn't have to deal with canna leaf rollers. But when they became common, and people are calling them canna leaf rollers, and I realized that they're not rolling the leaves. What they are, are canna unrolling, or uh, uh, preventing caterpillars. And a co-worker at that point suggested just calling them seal tights, which I think is good. But here you can see, I think we have a cat. Yeah, there's, well, it's actually not the caterpillar anymore. It's the uh, chrysalis, so the caterpillars entered into the chrysalis and um, you know will come out as the parent and actually one of them um, is a common little skipper skippers are essentially butterflies but we all know that the that family of insects are divided into butterflies and moths well skippers are actually the third group of insects in that family they're the little very active butterflies and they don't rest with their wings out or their wings folded. They're sort of, you know, like two layers, not, you know, like folded up like a butterfly or flat on the back like a um, um, moth. But that's the damage they do. And cannas have gone from a very valuable, you know, from garden display standpoint ornamental to one that's a bit more problematic because when the foliage is damaged there the whole plant can be rather unsightly. But I love these small flowered ones because the hummingbirds really like those flowers. I think our hummingbirds have mostly left. Uh, anybody agree with me? I've not seen them this what? week. What? You haven't seen them? In the past week. Yeah. Yeah. But it was a, I, I, it seemed, I think it was a good year for hummingbirds. Do you agree? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, last year didn't seem to be that good. <laughs> if we can keep the uh, chrysanthemums watered so they flower out normally, they're a great plant for pollinators in, in the fall. Um, nearly all the ones we grow in the garden are single ones, you know, daisy mums, and they're really phenomenally um, good for pollinators. Um, that time of year if you're planting things for pollinators you want to put them in a site that's sunny because on a cool fall day they'll they'll use the plants that are in the sun much more than they will the ones out in, um, you know, the, in the shade. And the thing to remember this time of year is the sun has already moved so far from where from its path in the summertime that some areas that were sunny in the summer or shady now or vice versa. You know, in the summer the sun comes up about there and travels around to about there so there's al almost everything, even the north side of my house gets sun for a brief period in the summer. And now it's rising about there and setting about there so, you know, um, you know, if you're planting for pollinators in the fall, keep that in mind. You know, fall is usually a really good time for roses, and it still still probably will be, but it's a little bit early for the big fall bloom of the roses. Um, we try to keep this watered, and but they'll freshen up in, you know, late October into November is a really good time for the roses. The um, butterfly rose over there with the single flower, Rosa mutabilis, um, mutable is referring to mutating because the flower color changes. You know, it's, I guess, opens sort of yellowish, turns pale yellowy pink, and then turns that dark color. That's a old, old Chinese cultivar that, um, you know, it's, it's a nice, strong growing, healthy, healthy thing. The um, blue salvia, of which there's so much, blame it on me. I like spikes of blue because it's such a contrast to the shapes and colors of roses. That's um, salvia pallida. In the heat of the day there's fewer insects visiting it but you notice a 
some um, bumblebees visiting, they really like it. And it blooms certainly by early summer up until frost. Um, Tim, not Tim, Chris asked about the flowering purslane or portulaca. This one, we, we just take cuttings before frost and overwinter some in the greenhouse and then plant it back out in the spring. There will be some seedlings. There's a seedling right there. But um, in order to have it where we want it, we like to start it from stem cuttings and, and, um, and plant it out in the spring. Is this salvia easy to grow, hard to grow? Um, it's real easy to grow. It's not a rambunctious spreader, but after a number of years, you'll probably have a bit more than you want. So is it less aggressive than the, the, the black and blue? The yes. Okay. Yes. Um, there, there's an old patch of it in that corner that's many years old. These were planted almost two years ago. And, you know, they made big clumps, but they, they're not galloping about the garden. Um, and you know, when, when it more than earns its keep because it's in bloom for five months of the year or so. What about the soil wet, dry? This is, this soil, you know, you wouldn't characterize it as wet. Um, it's well drained in this spot. It's only- But you're irrigating for roses. This does not have a built-in irrigation system, so it's not being watered on a regular basis. And normally, if we have normal rain, we don't water this garden no, at I just all. Meant, I was trying to get, you know, like selective watering, just the roses as opposed to broad. Oh, yeah, you know, we, we, Tim set up, you know, one of those tripods, mm -hmm. sprinklers. Um, you know, we got to keep it in good shape. This has become a popular uh, rental space that we're wedding in here on both Saturday and Sunday this past weekend, um, which was the main reason why we took out the center beds and planted turf. Um, um, you know, it's the, the CIA often um, offers to donate irrigation. Of course, you're see, thinking Central Intelligence Agency is involved with the irrigation. It's the Carolina Irrigation Association, the CIA, <laughs> not the Culinary Institute of America. Um, they often um, volunteer to do um, landscape, inst I mean, irrigation installation, partly as a training for some of their people. And I'm, a lot of parts of the Arboretum would be easier to water if we could just, you know, turn one valve rather than drag hoses around. This, this time of the year, I'm often wearing like a bright pink piece of flagging ribbon around my arm. So I remember I have irrigation on that I either need to move or I remember before I, I to turn it off before I go home. Um, you know, I don't, we don't want any part of the Arboretum to be watered once a week because it's Tuesday. We sort of water on an as-needed basis. Or, well, it's like the um, where we started this tour today at the en pedestrian entrance. Those gardens do have built-in irrigation. It's not controlled by a clock. It's controlled by one of us reaching into the ground, turning the valve off, and coming back later on. But that is a whole lot easier to water that way than you have to drag a hose and then move the hose every 20 minutes or so. So. You know, having irrigation in here would um, make the watering of this easier. Um, a happy thing to note is that we have, <coughs> oh, 10, 12 climbing roses on order that should be here, I think, next week. And so hopefully, not too many, maybe 18 months from now, the rest of these metal arbors will be clothed in um, climbing roses, so you're looking at plants and not clunky metal arbors. Um, so I'm happy about that potential. Well, um, I think we might call it a day. I'm happy to answer any questions if there's more, but otherwise, thank you for coming out today. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Doug. Thank you. Yeah.